Hello, everybody. I'm Lee Carroll, and we're going to call these meetings uh, Streaming with Lee, and these are free meetings. And uh, these are happening at the moment at a time, uh, it's a very um, astute time, I would say, in, in, in our history as uh, actually in humanity. This is April 6th when we're doing this, and we're still all separating and hunkered down in the various places. I'm coming from you, uh, coming to you from my studio in California with my tech, Carl. Uh, and then we have one other, and that is the guest who is joining us today, and that's the whole thing. When we're doing, uh, talking about virus things and all like that, you're getting a whole lot of information on the news. We're going to give you something that is very special today, very informative, very accurate, because we're bringing in John Ryan. Now, John Ryan is in Ottawa right now, and we're about to bring him in. He's a certified board physician, and he's working in Ottawa in a hospital. He does energetic-based medicine as well. He's got two books and... This is a whole different idea. The, the things that uh, he has got to say about this, you're, you're going to see something entirely different today. And I'm bringing him in on purpose. Um, I mean, very purpose. We've scheduled him, um, and we may even schedule him again, because of what he has to say and, and these things. You know, this is not doom and gloom, folks. There's an uplifting part of this, and you're going to see this. And he's actually going to bring in some information from Cryon as well. So let me um, go to uh, Ottawa and say, hello, John. Hi, Lee. It's so, uh, so nice to join you here today and to a big hello to all the people who are listening as well. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. And You're welcome. We'll be able to bring a very uplifting message to people about what's happening on the planet right now. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be wonderful to have an uplifting message from a physician. <laughs> we, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of physicians on the news who are uh, giving us things that are not uplifting. And there's, there's many things. So I, I'm really interested... In, I've, seen, I've seen your presentation slides, but I really haven't seen the dialogue and the lecture around them. So I'm really, um, I'm going to be right here glued and paying attention. Thank you, John. Awesome. Yeah, so that's great. So we'll talk, yeah, we will. We'll talk about the virus and we'll talk a little bit about the, the process of the virus so that people understand. But we'll use that really as a foundation lead to talk about uh, wisdom and how we, by understanding the actual mechanics or the science behind the infection, how we can use that for our own safety, but then also all the things we really need to understand as human beings to walk through this time with grace and with balance. And, uh, you know, a, a small amount of knowledge can go a far way in creating the balance. So we'll look at those details to the degree we need to understand them. And then we'll use that as a catalyst for for really understanding what we can do in this time to to thrive in a special way that that is awesome <laughs> i couldn't imagine anything better i'm so uh i'm feeling i'm feeling so uh, peaceful with this because it's time people heard something that is a little different from what they're hearing on the news and uh, from somebody like you who is an expert and also working in the trenches in the hospital thank you again it's really my pleasure yeah i'm really happy to be here so let's, let's say uh, we're going to begin the lecture, and John, mm -hmm. I'm going to turn it to you, and you have, I know, slides and things of this nature that you want to go, so I don't want to delay it anymore. Go for it. Okay, perfect. So we're going to take a look at uh, this, the whole phenomena of what's happening today through the perspective of thriving in a time of catalytic change. And we're going to talk about some science things. We're going to talk about COVID-19, the phenomena, the pandemic, the science behind it, and then we're going to take a look at the metaphysics that we can also understand around it and how this applies to you and the things that you need to know to or in order to go through this journey of the pandemic with, with grace and with balance. So we can say many, many things about what's happening on the planet today, and I'm sure we are all tired of hearing about the pandemic in different ways, as much as it's the most important thing that's happening on the planet today. But if we can say anything, we can surely say that change is upon us. And the change is massive. It, it's global. It's touching all facets of life. And it's going to touch each and every person in some way. And in fact, usually in a multiple number of ways. But the thing that's so important to understand about what's happening is that it has the capacity to reach into the crevices of our consciousness and really uncover the fears that we have lurking there. It touches upon our health, our financial situation, our family, our job security, 
the institutions we rely on for support, community relations, national relations, international relations, the list goes on and on. There's no stone unturned when we look at what's happening. And so all kinds of fear can be evoked from this. And then this, of course, is propagated by various channels of media that are, are trying to do the job of informing, informing us, but it's done in such a sensational way often that it, it also contributes to the fear that we have in a time like this. But the strange outcome of what's happening is that while all of this is happening around us, it's pushing us inside. It's pushing us inward and it's doing this physically as we all cloister in our homes and we try to self-isolate isolate and social distance and, and what have you, but in a more uh, conscious way or in a more spiritual way, if you will, it's also pushing us inside of ourselves to examine and to live this experience as a process of growth and development. And so the whole thing, when you look at it from the higher perspective of a spiritual experience, if you will, it's not without wisdom. And I know it's a little bit early in the pandemic to start talking Pollyannic things or positive things, but it's very, very important that we do understand the process and the bigger picture so that we do not lose our balance as we take steps together through this. There's a Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times. Well, I think we're living in very interesting times and I think they're going to actually get more interesting as we go into the days ahead. Now, as the weight of this phenomena kind of presses upon us, I think this picture kind of encapsulates um, the journey because there, this is a time of tremendous weight. There's so much happening, so many fears, so much information coming at us. It really weighs on us from the perspective of consciousness. And I think as we look back in the days ahead, we're going to look back and say, this was a very important time on the planet. Now I do say eventually, because I understand so many people right now are caught up in their own personal experiences. And there are people losing family members and they're going through the mourning of, of a terrible experience of the loss of someone that is so dear to them. And there's no words that can, can neutralize that in the time of grief, not really. So, you know, being sensitive to, to that element of things, we understand that we're really going to start talking here from a bit of a bigger picture, because if we have that understanding, we will be able to see why this event is so important and the potential that can come from, from an event like this, just, you know, in the face of all the tragedy and all the sadness that, that is evoked from it. And so when we stop for a minute and, and examine, we'll see that when we find ourselves in a crisis, there's a tendency for, the, for human beings to go into survival mode. And we see this you know, reflected in the news, the stories of people hoarding toilet paper and all the kind of you know, grabbing things from the market and leaving other people without. So when we're in survival mode, it has the tendency to push humanity to demonstrate both the best and the worst of our human nature. And so as this is happening, we also see incredible examples of community-minded spiritness. And we see real heroes, you know, people who are putting themselves in danger on the front line every day to bring, you know, healing and treatment to people who need it and to, you know, support the community, like the grocery store workers and all the people in essential services are really stepping up. And they're, they're heroes in my mind because they're putting themselves out in a way that is you know, cognizant of the danger of doing so, but they're doing it with a good heart and with a real potential for manifesting love, you know, in the time of a great crisis. So when we pause for a minute and we, we think of that and we honor these people, we realize there's an opportunity not just to survive here, but to thrive. And we're going to look at everything we need to understand this pandemic in its full spectrum. And then what we need to understand as individuals, not just to get through it, but to really thrive as we move through it and out the other side eventually in the days ahead. So here's my best advice as we start. Let's all keep calm and thrive on. Let's look at the, the, the pandemic from the perspective of understanding what's happening and what we can do with that information in a very intelligent and wise way and allow that to help us take on the pandemic right through to the other side of it and out the other side where we see some of the changes that we'll talk about in the future. So just a few minutes, let's take a look at the virus itself. Now, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the virus, 
But I do hear people saying things like, oh, let's not say the name of the virus and let's not, let's not speak about it. And if we ignore it, it will go away. But I'm a real proponent of intelligent wisdom. So when we understand the phenomena of a virus and when we understand the science of this virus, we begin to understand how to react to it, how to respond to it with intelligence, with grace and with balance. And so a lot has already been learned about this particular infection. And we can use that knowledge. And it is this knowledge that's actually being used in making the recommendations that are being made from the health, you know, healthcare bodies and other elements of, of the healthcare system and from governments. And so I know a lot of people feel that that may be top heavy or there may be an oppressiveness to some of those things. If you understand the true nature of what's happening, you'll see the wisdom that's in it and then how to relate to that in a very balanced and healthy way. So this virus itself is a coronavirus. And viruses are, it's, it's, it's within a group of viruses that are RNA-based viruses. So we all know about DNA. RNA is like DNA, except it's a, a messenger uh, nucleotide or string of nucleotides that works with DNA in the nucleus of the cell. And these viruses, what they are in essence, are little pieces of RNA that are encapsulated by a protective coating. And so it creates a shell around the RNA and the RNA has the potential to infect or move into a host cell. And what's important to understand about a virus is that a virus itself is actually not even a living entity. A virus cannot reproduce itself, which is a, a, a by definition, something that a living organism has to be able to do. A virus is just a piece of DNA or RNA information, and it can only reproduce itself when it enters into a host cell. So the RNA has to attach itself to a living cell, like the cells in our human body. And when it does that, then it can reproduce itself using the mechanism of the nucleus within that cell. And so these viruses are common. They've been around for a very long time, and there are lots of them. And we've been exposed to different coronaviruses. Uh, you know, the human population has been exposed to different coronaviruses. And this is a new one. And so the, they've caused, these kinds of viruses tend to cause respiratory type infections. And so we've seen this in the past in different infections that have you know, moved through the population and different kinds of flu type illnesses that have moved through the population. But in recent years, there have been a group of new ones that have emerged and they're a little more virulent and therefore a little more scary uh, to the human population. You've probably heard of things like SARS and MERS and these kinds of infections that cause acute respiratory illnesses and the potential for people, life-threatening illnesses because of the fact that they're affecting the lungs. And so this virus was originally named novel coronavirus or 2019 novel coronavirus. And I'm going to explain a little bit the nomenclature so you understand all these terms that get bantered around in the news. So 2019 NCOV was the original name of the virus. And it was recognized to be in the SARS family. So the name was changed to SARS-CoV-2. And that's the actual name of the virus itself. When a person carries the virus and it starts to produce an infection in the body, it's called COVID-19, Coronavirus Disease 2019. So the name of the disease process is COVID-19, which is different from the virus. It's similar to the difference between HIV and AIDS, human immunodeficiency virus, and the syndrome of AIDS. So what happens, if, on, the, on the left of this image, you see a picture of the virus. And at the surface, there are little tiny uh, projectiles, little spikes that seem to stick out of the surface of the virus. And these are kind of... Uh, surface proteins that bulge up from the surface and they create points of attachment. And it's these little spikes in the virus that allow it to attach to a healthy human cell. And this virus attaches to a receptor for something called enzyme ACE2. But that's not important. The thing that's important about it is these are present on the alveolar cells in the human lungs. And it's for this reason that the lungs and the respiratory system is so susceptible to the virus. So people say, well, where did this thing come from? Now, a lot of these viruses live in different or different species, if you will, or different kinds of organisms. So there are some viruses that tend to live in animals. 
And occasionally there's a zoonotic transmission. Now that's just a big word that means it transfers from an animal to a person. And so the belief is that some of these viruses are zoonotic. They transfer from animal species to the human being. These viruses are also used in scientific experimentation. So some of them are in laboratories and places like that, and they're used in different kinds of experiments. And so the, we don't know the point of origin exactly of how this virus made its way into the human population at this point in time. These are the two most common theories. And then there's a whole host of other theories that it came from, um, you know, the 5G network stimulating the immune system and all this kind of stuff. And I want to stop right here and put a little bit of common sense into this conversation. You have to be aware of the conspiracy theories that tend to rumble up around these things. The day will come when the facts are known and we will understand where this virus came from. And when we do, it's going to help us to make changes in our scientific system and in our political system and so on and so forth. For now, it's actually not that important where it came from. It's not the matter of the moment. But what is important is to understand not to put too much attention on it. And certainly, please don't buy into the conspiracy theories. They're only going to make you be afraid and be panicked about it and feel like, you know, society in some way is out to get you. And there's nothing more devitalizing than taking that stance about reality. Viruses are, are they're naturally occurring entities. And how this came into the human population will one day be known. For now, let's take care of the problem at hand. It's among us. And we're just going to use our wisdom to find our way through the pandemic. This is just a little slide to kind of go over an understanding of how the virus does its, its magic. So here it is, it attaches to the cell of the, of the host, so say a lung cell, and then it's unencapsulated and it moves into the nucleus where we make, it uses the, the mechanism that's present within the cell to reproduce the RNA and to reproduce the proteins to make new coats. And so all of this RNA and the material to make the coats is then put back together as a new virus. And then this virus moves to the membrane and it buds off and it's released. And so the virus kind of moves through the cell and it makes many, many copies of itself. And then a bunch of new viruses are released. And because we're talking about a lung cell here, when the virus comes out, it's going to be in the secretions or the saliva or the water that's present in the lungs and in the oral cavity. So the secretions from a person who's carrying the virus are the vector by which the virus can spread from a host person to another person. And this is going to be important in a minute when we look at the mechanisms of spread. The other thing to understand here is that a person who is putting out the virus may or may not be symptomatic at the point in time when they are doing that. And so there are a lot of flu-like illnesses that only become infectious when a person has symptoms. That's when they're putting out the virus, so to speak. But it seems from the science to date that this virus may be released before a person knows they carry it. And so this is what's causing a lot of the concern about how we can actually spread this virus. But if we understand that it can happen before an infection is known in the person, it helps us plan and it helps us know how to respond to it with intelligence and with wisdom. And so there are people who seem to be infected with the virus who go through developing an immunity and almost have no symptoms at all. And that, in fact, appears to be the majority of people. There's another group of people who will develop mild symptoms, and we'll talk about that next. And then a group of people who develop a more serious illness. But this is a very small number of the total infections. So people who get a very serious infection are small in number compared to the total number of people who develop the infection. So what happens when you get a virus in your body? So what's interesting here is that it's not the virus that causes all of the things that we see. It's the immune system in your body responding to the virus that does it. So when your body begins to fight off the infection or the intruder, it does all kinds of things to help it be able to do that successfully. You develop a fever to raise the temperature in your body. You put out white blood cells in order to be able to go after the infection and remove it from your body. And it's all of these things that cause the primary symptoms of an infection, the fever, and then the constitutional things like chills and 
the nausea and sometimes vomiting and diarrhea. People will start to develop coughing and chest symptoms as there is inflammation developing in the lungs. So a person who has an established infection or what's called a viral pneumonia will start to cough. They may cough up a little bit of mucus or even sometimes a little bit of blood and they will develop shortness of breath and chest pain. And that's more a direct symptom from the pneumonia itself. So as the disease progresses in a person who gets a more serious disease, these symptoms just tend to get worse. Now, the challenge here as a human is that a lot of these symptoms overlap with other things. So for example, the, the primary symptoms of coronavirus are fever, cough, shortness of breath and chest pain or difficulty breathing. And some of these things also happen when we have an everyday flu. And some of them can also happen when we have things like allergies. So you need to understand this because this is also flu season and it's also allergy season. So not everybody who is developing these symptoms is going to have coronavirus. And so we just need to use a little bit of common sense. But when you do have the symptoms that are attributable to coronavirus, it's important to be aware of it to, and to do the things that you need to do if that's the truth or if that's the case in the moment. Now, I thought it might be interesting just to put in a little bit of radiology here, which is the kind of medicine that I do. This is a CT of a chest in a patient who has known uh, coronavirus infection. And you can see the arrow on the left of the image, it's pointing to an area that's white when all the tissue around it is black. And the black tissue is your lung. And the reason it's black is because it's filled with air. There's not much tissue in there. And what happens when you get an infection is that the body reacts and you get inflammation. And then as you know, there's secretions and all this kind of stuff happening and inflammation, the airspace consolidates or it fills in with that fluid and that debris. And it creates an area that cannot exchange oxygen. So if you look at the normal healthy lung here, the black lung, your lungs are used to bring oxygen into your body and oxygenate everything. And so if there's a, an infection in the body, there's a part of the lung that's not going to work so well. Now in this person, it's a very small pneumonia. So most of the lung here is gonna work very, very well. And so they would not have problems, so, so to speak, with their, you know, their breathing or their level of oxygen in their body. But what can happen is in a very small number of people that progresses. And so if that happens, there's more inflammation in the lungs. And so it gets a little bit more difficult for the person to do the normal oxygen exchange. And so this person will be getting into a little bit of trouble with their breathing. And it, it's this person who will need more direct medical attention or who may be admitted to the hospital. So in this very small subgroup of people, this is what is happening. And this is what leads to all the talk around ventilators. So when a person needs support from the medical system around this, what will happen is if they're admitted to the hospital, they'll need support with air exchange. So a ventilator is used to increase the amount of oxygen your body gets. And by doing that, you can nurse the body through the acute illness while it's healing and then allow the body to come out the other side with a, you know, with a, when the inflammation begins to settle down. So the ventilators are used for support. And so that's why they become so important. And you hear all kinds of uh, talk about absence of them and the, you know, the dramas that are related to that. So using that, we'll just take a minute to understand how this virus spreads. So it's spread by droplets. It's the secretions you know, that come from a person who's carrying the virus. So the droplets that they make in the fluid, so the saliva, can be coughed out. And there's two ways that a person can be exposed to that. If a person coughs on you, there can be a direct transmission. So the way that becomes important is we understand this concept of social distancing. By staying six feet away from a person, if we were to cough and carry the virus, we're not going to cough and land a droplet on another person. So just by accepting the fact that we stay a little farther apart from each other physically, that helps decrease the spread of the infection. The other thing to understand is there's a difference between droplet and airborne diseases. And so this is a droplet transmission, not an airborne transmission. And it's an important distinction to make because airborne transmissions happen when the virus is carried in little tiny micro particles of fluid and they can penetrate normal masks and these kinds of things. And so for this, you need a more serious mask. It's called an N95. And so it's a mask that allows you to really block out all the infection and all the possibility for transmission. 
So that would really need to be used in a hospital setting. An everyday surgical mask would be adequate to protect someone from droplet precautions. But if we're social distancing, we don't actually need a mask per se. However, droplets can also land on things. So if a person coughs and it lands on their, you know, they cough into their hand and then they put their hand on the doorknob, they can carry the virus from their hand to the doorknob. So this is why the, the other recommendations come into the picture. It's important to be washing your hands after any kind of contact with the outside world. If you go to get some groceries and these kinds of things, the first thing you should always do when you come back is wash your hands. And so you see, by understanding the science behind this transmission, you see what the recommendations are and why they're put into place. And they're not at all uh, foolish. They're very sensible. And you'll understand the, you know, the, the rationale, if you will. So when you're out in public, if you keep a little bit of physical isolation through social distancing, if you wear gloves, if you, have, you can wear a mask if you have one, and then when you return home, you wash your hands, and you wash the surface of anything you bring into your house. Just simply doing that would make the likelihood of you getting the virus very, very low. So just understanding the science of all that, you know what to do and what kind of recommendations to follow. And so these are very well known now, washing your hands, coughing into your elbow, washing your hands after you cough or sneeze not touching your face after, while you're out in public or when you come home until you have the opportunity to wash your hands, avoiding close contact or physical contact with people for the, for the time being, and then avoid any unnecessary travel. And so all of these recommendations that have been put forth by the government and various health agencies, are they're not draconian. They just make sense understanding the science of the infection. And then you have to stay attuned to your local laws and recommendations. But regardless, no matter what people are saying, you know, from a level of local government or what have you, if you understand the science of the virus, you know what to do yourself. And there's nothing more important than knowledge in that regard. So just to touch on a couple of the other words we hear a lot about, this concept of a pandemic, all that means is it's an infection that's spreading far. So if you, you know, if you had a small outbreak of an infection in a nursery, you know, or a, a daycare center or whatever, it's an outbreak. An epidemic is when it touches more people within a cloister or a community of people. And a pandemic is an infection that spreads to different areas, and in this case, around the world, and it involves many people. So pandemic is just a word used in terms of uh, epidemiology that explains the, you know, the geographic spread and human spread of an infection. It just means it's going far and wide. And the other concept is flattening the curve. We hear this a lot and we're told it's important. And it is an important thing to understand. And there's a little graph here from the CDC that explains it simply. When the infection starts and it spreads to different people, if we don't do anything about it, the infection will rise really rapidly and then it'll peter out over time. The problem is this is the level of healthcare system capacity. So this defines the number of beds in the hospital and the ICUs and all that kind of stuff. So if we let this infection kind of run willy nilly, it will overwhelm the healthcare system. And so people who are trying their very best to take care of people who have the more serious form of the infection will find that they have, they have no place to put these patients. And so the hospitals run out of capacity. And this is what we see happening now in places like Italy and New York. And they're having to create makeshift hospitals to take care of patients outside of the normal system. If we do the things we're being asked to do, like social isolation and all that kind of stuff, what happens is this big peak doesn't happen. It happens over a slower rate because the transmission is slowed down. And that just allows the healthcare system to respond to the problem without being overwhelmed. And now it does kind of uh, add a little bit of a lag to the infection. It actually kind of makes it go on a bit longer, but it does in a very controlled way. And so we're able to live through it without the, the stress and the urgency of not having resources and the things that we see being talked about on the news. So self-care becomes the most important thing that you need to understand as a person. So I just want to review the science behind the infection so that you understand how simple it is to know what to do. And the best cure of all is prevent. And you can only prevent if you have the knowledge of what's happening and then the reasons why you're going to make choices to do things or not do things. 
And then you have to understand that taking care of your yourself is the most important thing. I love this picture of the, you know, in an airplane when the airbag drops. And even as a mother with a, you know, a baby or a child beside you, you're told, first, put on your mask. In other words, you have to take care of yourself. If you try to start taking care of your child, which, of course, is going to be your innate response, and you haven't put on your own oxygen mask, you're going to get weak from not having oxygen. And energy is the same way. If you take care of yourself and your body and your psychology and the things we're going to talk about next, you realize you'll be in a place to help other people and to do it in a balanced way. And the funny thing about this infection is it's time to be community minded. And the strangest thing about it is the way to take care of the community for the most part is to be in isolation. So it's kind of a paradox, you know, by doing all the right things, we are physically isolating ourselves. But to physically isolate and socially isolate are not the same thing. You can still be very socially engaged. We're, we're speaking now through the format of an online interview. You know, there are webinars. There are all kinds of ways to communicate with your family, you know, through Facebook and Zoom and all these kinds of stuff. So you can stay engaged with your community and with people, even though we're physically isolated. But it's important to do that right now for all the reasons that we've talked about. So we're going to talk for a few minutes just about self-care and your immunity. And this is a very 3D part of the discussion. We're going to go into some more esoteric things later. But for right now, let's talk about things that we can do that just make good sense. And the easiest way I find to do this is to see yourself as a multi-layered being. As a human, you have a physical body, you have an emotional capacity, you have a mental capacity, and there's a spiritual element to our reality. And what really brings health and balance to us is when all of these things operate in coherence. And so we learn to nourish our physical body in a healthy way. We learn to live emotionally in a way that doesn't knock us out of balance. We learn to use our mind to move forward and to, to bring ourselves uplifting messages and to bring us out of the tendency to be negative. And then spiritually, we can rely on all kinds of inspiration that help us through all the other bodies. Now it's hard to separate them in isolation because they don't exist in isolation. They all exist together, but we can break them apart for understanding. And if we really give each part of us what we need, each level of our being what we need, you can see that we'll establish a coherence or a balance in ourselves. And we'll have be that little happy face in the middle of it all. So you might ask, well, what do you do? Well, from a very general perspective, so many people right now are being asked to stay at home. And we all know we're sleep deficient. We don't get enough sleep. So this is a wonderful time to catch up on your sleep, to do things that you know are relaxing or you enjoy, to partake in hobbies, to do yoga, stretching, breathing. You can take a little time outside as long as you follow the rules of social isolation and go for a nice walk in nature. You can take baths. Really, this, this, the list could go on, but you know yourself what, what you respond to best and give yourself the right, the the privilege, the opportunity to really say, yes, this is important and it's time for this right now and I'm going to do it. I love the little cartoon on the right because trying to do yoga at home, if you have pets or children, I think you can probably relate to this cartoon. It's really the way it is. On a physical level, the most important thing in this list, I believe, is food. So, you know, while we're cloistered at home and watching television, it's not the time to load up on chocolate bars and treats and all that kind of stuff. Of course, you can have a treat, but it's a time to really eat well and nourish your body with things that it needs that contain vitamins and minerals and all the stuff that we know are good for us. So, you know, eat a variety of vegetables and fruits and a little bit less on the sugars and all the things that we're told is general food advice. And it'll give your body a foundation to, to operate well. It'll be running well. And it'll, it's, the immune system responds to that by operating well. So just feed yourself good food, good organic, you know, healthy food. There are some supplements that people recommend, things like vitamin C or selenium, herbs like echinacea and garlic and astragalus root, or mushrooms like reishi mushrooms or shaga mushrooms. And these are, are various things that have been shown in controlled scientific studies to support the immune system, and particularly in light of viral infections. So these are things that you can consider using. But to me, they are secondary to the way you eat and to your food. And then you can use these things to enhance your immunity if you feel you need to. 
on an emotional level, I think the most important thing is not what you do, but what you don't do. And that is not overreacting to events. As you look at the media, you have conversations with your friends, there's a tendency to dramatize things. And then by doing that, of course, we get emotionally stirred up in it and we start overreacting. And therefore, we end up in a spin. And so limiting our exposure to media, just limiting it to a good source of information that you know is reliable, and then pretty much cutting out the rest of it, because all it does is create it, like energetic drama within your emotions. And nurture, nurturing your emotional needs at this time, let yourself watch shows you like, tune into Gaia, tune into things on YouTube where there's sources of information that you enjoy and are uplifting. Spend time talking with your friends on, on YouTube or on the phone and have you know, nice conversations that we don't always have the time to do. Listen to music and do any kind of activity that you find inspirational. On a mental level, reading, learning, there's so many things online and a lot of universities have started offering free programs for people to do courses and all this kind of stuff. And you actually have the time to do it while you're at home. So it's a wonderful opportunity to learn, you know, learn whatever it is you've been wanting to learn, but putting off for whatever reason. And then from a spiritual perspective, it's a wonderful time to be meditating or to do things that help you feel centered. And it's a time for us all to develop an incredible self-awareness and to support ourselves in this development. You see, as we each go through this experience, we're all going to have our own moments where we feel unbalanced or we feel something scares us or, you know, something we hear news and it's going to challenge us in different ways. And we have to be self-aware. We have to see what's happening within our own emotional and mental state and know how to be with that so it doesn't knock us off our game. It's so important to stay centered and stay balanced and not to find yourself spinning in that. And I think one thing we're all going to learn as we go through this is how to be very masterful around that. And then align yourself with high vibe principles. Peace. There's a peace that passes understanding that is available to each and every one of us. And when you plant your feet on the dirt of the earth and you open your soul to, the, to receiving that energy, you will feel it come into your body. It's a physical, tangible 3D experience. And so this is a time to embody that peace and be very vigilant at anything that tends to knock you out of that balance. And to be compassionate. Compassionate with yourself, first of all. When you find yourself getting you know, spun out or upset about something, just become aware and see it for what it is. There's no reason to react to it or judge yourself around it. Deal with yourself with the same compassion you would give to another person. And when you see somebody in a state that is you know, less than ideal, try to be with them in a compassionate way and to bring them you know, the opportunity to come back to the center within themselves too. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for us all to practice these things. I just want to talk for a minute about being an empath. And I know people listening to this for the most part are people who are interested in new information and you know, the evolving consciousness that we talk about so much with Cryon. And so we're empathic by nature. We all have this ability to feel in a transpersonal kind of a way. And we're aware of the field around us. We feel the thoughts and the feelings of people around us. Now imagine during a pandemic, what's happening is so many people want to spin into this place of, you know, concern and fear and the drama that's propagated and all this kind of stuff. It causes so much fear in the global field of consciousness. And if you're not aware of what you're living, you can find yourself souped up in that too. You'll just get, you know, knocked completely off your own, you're out of your own harmony. And so we're sensitive to this and we need to understand that and we need to stand in the light of our own knowing. And you have to give yourself whatever it is that you need to hold this balance or to regain it if you lose it for a little bit of time. And one thing just from talking to people who are, you know, in my own healing circle and community, people are feeling a fatigue. It's a physical symptom. And I think a lot of it is just the, the you know, the energy experience of holding the balance in a field of change around you. So do not judge yourself for it. If, if you're tired, go lay down, take a rest, meditate, do whatever you need to do to revitalize. And don't think the fatigue is something you're doing wrong. 
It's just because you're doing your job. You're a light worker. And by holding that light, of course, you're going to feel these kinds of things from time to time. So remember, consciousness is key. I love, the, I love when Greg Braden says we were built for these times. And, you know, humanity has been for years and years saying, oh, cry on, this is not happening fast enough. We need to change human consciousness. Let's make this happen. Well, I think change is here. And so this is the time we have been born for. And so as you have been practicing and learning things in consciousness over, you know, the months and years and decades that have gone by, this is an opportunity to put everything you've ever been learning into practice and really learn how to hold your balance in a storm. If you're a lighthouse, you're going to stand there and you're going to shine. And so that's really what this time is about. And your consciousness is key to reharmonizing yourself and allowing yourself the opportunity to do that. So in that light, we can kind of repurpose the pandemic. It's really a time of learning to reuse, recycle, and become much more conscious of how things take place on the planet. But this is a time for us to repurpose a little bit the pandemic and ask yourself, how are you living? Are you wise and well-informed? However, remain peaceful, balanced, free of hype, in a space of compassion. Are you living fearlessly and in a love field space? If not, then you need to nurture yourself and let yourself move into this arena. It's truly a test of mastery for all of us. And we might as well use it for that way. And here's my message. You got this. You know you have been born to go through times like this and to hold the mastery and the light you have inside of you. And the next part of our talk, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about that. It's more esoteric. It's not as 3D and scientific as the first part of the talk, but we'll, we'll take the time to go into the esoterics of the energy changes and things that are happening. But let's take a little break here at this point. Before we go into part two, I will uh, take a moment. Let's go back and see how Lee is doing. John, Lee is doing fine. I mm -hmm. am enthralled with this. You're a master presenter. I want to take lessons from you. <laughs> um, <laughs> what you're saying is so much of what we teach, and I think it's the common sense of it. Um, if you've heard the um, Cry and Channels just recently, the ones that we gave in Toronto, uh, that is the theme. Um, and, and thank you for this. Uh, it's, it just makes so much sense not to overreact and to know the facts. And this is, this is great. Thank you so much for that. It's um, a pleasure, Lee. <laughs> I, can, I, can I just uh, pick your brain on one or two little things that I'm hearing and that, that I'm thinking? Is that all right with you? Yeah. Well, one of the issues that um, we've mentioned in the seminars and also that I even think Cryon has mentioned is that we are, we are getting the media is giving the story. Uh, they're giving it, of course, 24-7. <laughs> but we're only getting one part of it. And we're not, we're not getting the, um, the rest of it. And one of those rest of it is, is we're hearing that we're losing health workers because they are on the front lines and they're getting the virus and they're going home sick. We're losing police uh, the same way and they're going home sick. And then they move on to another story. You know, they say, well, how many have you lost? And how many have you lost? And how many have you lost? And, and you, you come to the end of the, of the segment from the media and you realize they are not equipped to give you the rest of the story. And this is, I'm not sure this is a fault of the media or just the fact that this is the way it was designed from the beginning with news. And now suddenly it's important they give you the rest. And the rest is this, to me, you're losing healthcare workers, you're losing policemen, and they're not going to their graves. I mean, what's happening is they're getting sick, they go home, they go through this, they recover, and they come back to work immune. Have I got this wrong? No, you don't have it wrong. And I think you touch upon some really important points, Lee. It's, I mean, in all, in all respect, there, there are people who are living a very difficult experience in the sense that, you know, there are people dying and there are people whose lives are being lost as this infection spreads around the world. And so there are lots of families who are going through the episode of grief and the, you know, the whole experience that comes with losing someone that's so dear to us. And with no sense of, no insensitivity to that experience, I think we have to be very cautious how we talk about these things because the last thing you want to do is hurt somebody who's in that space of experience at this point in time. But the vast majority of people who do get this infection recover. 
And so whether you have a mild infection or even if you have a more moderate level of infection with symptoms, even a more serious infection that may require you to go into the hospital, the vast majority of people who get the infection will recover. And when you recover, you recover with immunity. So there are many healthcare workers who've been exposed to the virus and are, you know, have developed the pneumonia to some degree or another and the, of the other symptoms that go along with it. There are people in all sectors of life, in the policemen, the firemen, the first responders, all these people. I think the challenge with the media is they have this balance between trying to present information that's meaningful and authentic, but there is a tendency for it to be dramatized. So what ends up happening is you want to tell the truth, but it takes the spin that you know is going to be exciting or thrilling, or it's going to captivate people, people's attention. And it's completely understandable when you realize the media is based on an economic model where it needs viewers. And so therefore it does what it needs to do in order to create an audience. And so it, it's a mixture because they are presenting authentic information in many ways, but it, there's a little bit of a spin of drama, I think that, that takes over sometimes. So it's, it's not to say it's all bad. And I think it is part of the model. Like you say, it's part of the system. But the truth is, and that's what's really important, is the most people who, the, the vast majority of people who will get this virus and develop an infection from the virus will recover. And it's true of the healthcare workers, it's true of the policemen, it's true of the emergency responders, it's true of the service people like grocery clerks and other people who are still out in the environment and being exposed potentially to this infection. And so, you know, we have to bear that in mind, but that doesn't make news, you know, to hear that 10,000 people recovered from the virus doesn't have the same dramatic impact as saying 100 people died. And so in the balance of things, most people will recover. And I think we need to know that so that we don't overreact. It's important that we have compassion for anybody who's touched by this or who loses a family member or someone dear to them. It's a terrible thing under any circumstance, and this is no exception. But the vast majority of people who get this infection will recover, they'll live healthily, and they will have immunity to this in the future. And so one of the things I think we'll start seeing happen is we'll have these superheroes, if you will, there'll be you know, nurses and physicians and people who are now immune to the infection, and they can walk around the hospital with very little protective gear in a sense because they will be immune to the infection. They're going to, so they're going to be the, uh, the heroes. Yeah, exactly. You're going to say exactly. then they're walking around completely immune. They've been tested. <laughs> so maybe that will they make... Can, they can go in any dangerous place. And, uh, <laughs> exactly. And maybe would... that will make the news when that happens. I, we'll that's going to make the news. I think that will be a movie <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and when this is all over as well. That's right. That's also, right. the thing that um, I think it was myself and also with the crying and say is that in the reporting, it would be nice to see a, reco a recovery column instead of uh, what we're seeing now. It says infected, died, and that's it. Yeah, and we, we don't have a column for recovery. There are a couple of news agencies graph, I've, you know? I've noticed that have started to do that. They oh, have good. in their they'll have a little bar to the side of their screen, and in the bar they may have number not like confirmed recovered cases. Good. I, I think the other thing we have to bear in mind too is I don't think we really know the true scope of this infection, and because testing has been so sporadic and difficult. We don't know the number of people who've had this infection. And I believe in the community at large, there are many, many people who've had very mild or no symptoms who are immune, but we de would never registered them as a case because mm -hmm. they weren't that, sick That was the other thing I was saying, is that how many are actually immune just naturally because they got yeah. a stronger immune system. That, that's and that's right. another special I want to do. I'd like to bring in Dr. Todd Ovakaitis and talk about the uh, RNA and the DNA and the immune system because that's his specialty is uh, yeah. boosting that. I'd love so to see that. We, we don't know a lot of <laughs> things at the moment. You know. <laughs> so let's take a little pause here. Um, we'll, we'll take a few minutes in case you want to stretch your legs or you know, go refresh yourself in any way. We'll finish part one, take a break, and then we'll come back in a couple of minutes and we'll move into the next part of the presentation where we deal with some of the more esoteric elements of healing and how that ties into the story of this pandemic. Thank you, John. I can hardly wait for part two with all of the esoterics. Of course, that's where I thrive. And so everybody take a break and then come back and start part two and we'll be here waiting for you. Thank you. <laughs> 